So our special guest today is Gage Greenwood. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm a stay-at-home dad. Uh, I used to work, I was the vice president of an escape room company. I did that for years, um, but now the writing has uh, has made it so I can stay home with my son and, and write all day. Um, I'm a horror author um, who sometimes genre blends so much that my readers have jokingly invented a new genre specifically for me called dread pop um and uh yeah my third novel just came out uh at the beginning of the summer bunker dogs yeah and things are going good brilliant that's great to hear so tell us about your books uh so i have three novels and two short stories that are all available um the two short stories are a couple quick uh, like 20 page uh, horror stories. One's more psychological and the other is a classic monster in the woods story during a, a blizzard. Yeah. Um, and then my first novel was winter's Myths, which, uh, which kind of set me into a position of uh, no one really knowing what they were going to get from me because it's not quite straight horror. Um, it has horror elements, but it also is dark fantasy and post-apocalyptic and very weird. Um, but it, it, uh, as genre bending as it is and how uh, maybe difficult to market as it is, uh, it's found a very passionate fan base, which has been really nice. Um, so, and then the so sequel you basically that, didn't it, want to stay in one genre. You just wanted to get them all in there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> put it on the one book. <laughs> uh, and then the sequel for that came out in January. And then in June, I, I published Bunker Dogs, which is my first uh, standalone horror novel. Um, which is a, an interesting story of a girl trapped in a bunker during a giant war with bombs blowing up above her. And she soon realizes she's not alone in the bunker. There's something in the walls. Yeah. Fantastic. So can you tell us about the first horror story that you ever wrote? Um, well, we're probably going back to like when I was 12. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the, well, the first stories I ever wrote were really bad Ninja Turtle fanfic before fanfic was a term. <laughs> um, and then I started writing very um, uh, Poe ripoff type stories um, mixed with like Tales from the Crypt style stuff where it was always like uh, every story was about the bad guy and he was just reading to get to his comeuppance sort of. Yeah. Um, because those were my big influences. I watched all those anthology shows like Tales from the Dark Side, Tales from the Crypt. And uh, the first horror book I ever went from page one to the last page was the complete collection of Edgar Allan Poe. So, yeah. so I was uh, big on ripping those off. But the first, uh, I would say, publishable type stories that I ever wrote were like directly after I sobered up. So they're, um, they're these kind of, I was in like a very dark place and they were, they're very bleak. Um, dreadful horror stories yeah that's good though isn't it if you've come from a dark place you've also got that experience that you can sort of like draw on as well to put into your writing a lot of uh, people have said that they do draw on their experiences especially if they've got traumas and things like that it helps with their writing when they're writing horror yeah definitely and there's always a piece of that in my story even like in winter's myths which is a little more wild and wacky um it, it goes to dark places and it's and it always is um it's usually me trying to to either answer a question or explore um a thought about myself um or or the people around me like yeah. um my short story through flickering lights a silhouette is about a, a little girl looking for her adopted brother in a winter storm um and there's monsters and for me the whole point of that story was me kind of telling the story of my my grief and addiction from the perspective of my sister who was trying to save me yeah. um so, so it was kind of my way of being able to see into her brain what she was seeing at that time but yeah. told with monsters instead yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired you to write in the horror genre um i, I would have to say my family um i grew up when uh, my, my brother's nine years older than me and my sister's seven years older than me. So as a little kid, they were teenagers and they were really big into the horror movies of the time, which this was the 80s. So 
was a lot of slashers and um, Poltergeist and, and all those 80s movies. Um, and at the same time, my mom was a uh, was a big collector of King and Coots. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then my sister had that Poe collection, which I stole from her. So I would say they, they were my biggest influences in, in turning me on to horror because they were all fans of it. Yeah. So you stole your sister's Poe collection. Yes, I did. Yeah. How did, how did that go down? <laughs> um, I think she thought it was cool because like her younger <laughs> brother was getting into horror, you know, <laughs> same way I am with my son. Whenever he likes something creepy, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny okay so what's the most challenging aspect of writing for you um one is finding the time <laughs> um it seems like when i sit down to write um the more time i have in one block the the quicker and and better the ideas start to come out but being a stay-at-home dad and you know, having to take care of daily household stuff, uh, I have to break it up more, <laughs> um, yeah. especially when my, my son is home. Um, so I kind of get these like 10 minute chunks of time where I got to sit down and write. And you just start to get going by the time you get to stop again. Um, so finding the time is definitely a big one. And then um, another one is just kind of uh, balancing the therapeutic nature of writing and the telling a good story <laughs> nature of writing. Yeah, because uh, if you go too far one way, you're basically just journaling. And if you go too far the other way, uh, there's no catharsis. And there's, uh, you know, the reader wants to feel the emotion of the story, not just point A to point B. So kind of combining those two things. Yeah. So have you ever scared yourself with something that you've written? <laughs> um, I don't think I have. I've unsettled myself or, or creeped myself out. <laughs> but I wouldn't say scared myself. Um, in Bunker Dogs, it's very claustrophobic, and there is a scene where someone gets stuck <laughs> um, while something is coming after her, uh, and that that just made me squirm a little because of, I'm, I'm claustrophobic. So uh, <laughs> I have, however, made myself cry a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> so have you written anything that you thought that you've gone a little bit too far in? No. Um, I'm not sure I like believe in it too far. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the job of the artist is to take things as far as they feel comfortable taking it. Um, and for me, I, I don't think there's necessarily a, a bad far um, as long as there's a purpose behind it. Yeah. Um, but I did, I, when I, uh, Grackles on the Feeder is a short story of mine um, that has some very common. I would say the big uh, triggers for people in it, um, which is um, assault, uh, sexual assault and animal cruelty. Uh, and when I published that, I kind of like said, there's going to be a lot of people who don't, who don't like this one, um, <laughs> especially since it's not typical for the, what I write. Um, you know, so if you read winter's myths, which is sort of whimsical and wacky and then went to that one, you'd be like, Whoa. A big difference. Yeah. So are there any memorable reactions that you've had from readers? <laughs> um, good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way all, I like the way when I ask this question, all authors just like giggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I've received uh, memorable in, in both directions. Um, you know, I've had for good. I've had uh, people who have said that. Winter's Myths is the favorite thing they've ever read, and people who are working on getting tattoos of the characters from it, which is the coolest thing in the world to me. And then on the other side of the spectrum, I had somebody burn my book on video because they hated it. So, much, so. <laughs> I think that I think I had another author on who said that their book was burnt as well. It must be something going right. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly. A, <laughs> it's certainly a finalized reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find sales that day? <laughs> um, no, because you didn't have enough popularity. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wish it was someone with a big following because it probably would have improved my sales. <laughs> so how do you think the horror genre has evolved over the years, in your opinion? Uh, I've seen a lot of a lot of changes specifically in the last 20 years. Um, I think 
par um, has to adapt to the time period that you're in. Even if you're writing like a classic Victorian, you're going to have themes that are more focused on on today. Um, and I think for a, a large part of the last 20 years, the, the zeitgeist, at least in America, um, has been confused and, and changes rapidly with the, I guess, probably because of the internet. And I think there's been a lot of uh, trying to find a foothold in the industry in the last 20 years. And we've seen that with sales where they've, they've dropped dramatically and then now they are skyrocketing again. Um, and I think for a time period, there was a lot of, um, authors who were really trying to get into social commentary, which I think is great. I do that too. Um, but they didn't quite know how to do it. And it was almost, um, really like in your face, uh, almost like after school special, uh, where instead of like telling a story that, that meant something, it was almost like they were stopping their story to say like, Hey, here's my point. Um, and I, and I think that that sort of turned a lot of people away from the industry because they felt like they were being preached to for a while. Um, and I don't think, that desire for social commentary has changed. I think it's still there. In fact, I think it might even be bigger now. Yeah. But I think people, authors have learned more how to integrate it into the purpose of the story. Um, and I think the advent of book talk and bookstagram has also uh, been huge for our industry because horror for the, the last 20 years where we saw bookstores changing and borders closing and a lot of bookstores closing um, and Barnes and Noble sort of shifting their paradigm. Um, we saw the horror sections go away in a lot of places and, you know, King and Coons went over to thriller or mystery or wherever. Um, and then, you know, you go on Amazon, even today, you go on Amazon, you can't just click on horror. You have to like go to sub genres to find the horror genre. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Book Talk and Bookstagram came out and we saw these these reviewers who were huge fans of the genre showing off books that people didn't know existed. And it blew up. And now we see like independent authors um, doing better than traditionally published authors in a lot of cases. Um, you see people like Duncan Ralston and Nick Roberts who are just like crushing it as independent authors. Um and that's because Book Talk and Bookstagram showed that when horror is visible, horror sells, you know? Um, and we, I think we need to see the bookstores and Amazon catch up to that and start putting horror back to the front, um, and you'll see more sales in that genre. Yeah, Amazon's kind of like hit us, haven't they? What's that? I said Amazon's kind of like hit us. Yeah, yeah, we're like buried <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then when you do find us uh you know the the top 100 books aren't even horror <laughs> they're <laughs> they're like romance horror you know <laughs> nothing against romance horror i'm not i'm not trying to bash it but it's not if, if, if me as a reader who doesn't read romance wants to find just a straight horror book uh it's very difficult to do just by searching, you know, I mean, I go to places like books of horror and places like that to find them. But if I was just searching on Amazon, it would be a nightmare. Yeah, that's right. What advice would you give to aspiring horror writers? <sighs> One piece, because I could, I could talk all day about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, just do it. Um, I went in and uh, held back from publishing for a long time because you know you hear all the advice you need a website you need to start building your mailing list now before you even publish um you need to pay for good covers you need to pay for good editing you need to do all these things and it becomes this like insurmountable mountain that that will just stop you from doing it yeah um and all of that stuff can come late i ended up finally when i finally did it um i went i, I went in on a zero dollar budget i made my own cover i used pro writing aid and did my own self edits for a while and then as soon as money came in I put all of it right back in. Like I, I still have never made a profit. Everything I make goes back in somehow. Um, so I pay for better editing, pay for better covers, and my website and emailing list and blah, blah, blah. I did all that as I went. Um, and if I hadn't done it that way, I never would have started. Um, and and if you're worried you're going to make mistakes or that you're going to suck or you know whatever's going to happen, um, it'll happen. Like You're going to make mistakes. I made a million of them. And I learned from them and I kept growing. 
um, and I experimented and I tried things that failed and then I moved on and tried something else. Um, and as far as like sucking goes, <laughs> how many, how many best selling books weren't good? You know, yeah. it doesn't, you know, just, just keep trying to improve. Just as long as you're focused on trying to improve, you're going to improve and you're going to get better. Um, and one person, you know, 10 people, a hundred people are going to think your book sucks. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Um, it's just what happens, you know, but you know, so people, I think Stephen King sucks. people think Hemingway sucks, you know, they're going to think you suck too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Everybody's different though, aren't they? So one person's going to like your book. Another person isn't going to like your book. So it just, it's just a throw of a hat really, isn't it? Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, the best thing you can do is promote yourself. Uh, I think a lot of authors really worry about that because um, you don't want to turn people off. And you can, like, because there's a balance. You need to be able to promote yourself all the time, but do it in interesting ways where you're not just dropping your link in people's faces because nobody's going to like that, you know? Like the analogy that I always use is when Coca-Cola gets together with their ad team at the beginning of the year, they say, we have a billion dollars to spend. And no one on the ad team says, but what if we annoy people, you know? <laughs> promote as much as you can promote all the time, always, because the algorithm is never going to show all of your posts to the same people all the time. And there are people right now who you could post a hundred times over the next year about your book and there will be people on your friends list who didn't know about it because they just never saw the post. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you got to make it interesting because the people who do see the same post every day are going to be like, I can't deal with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Unfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the, if you look at Coca-Cola too, their ads are always different. They always try and find a way to make you laugh or to make you, you know what I mean? They try and bring something up. It's not yeah. just like, buy our, buy our soda please you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so have you got any upcoming projects or releases that you're excited about i do um i'm uh working on a book called on a clear day you can see block island um which is a coming of age horror um can't give away too many details yet because i haven't finalized the blurb for it and it's always really tough for me to not spoil stuff when i talk about it but it's going to be um a fun coming of age horror novel um, in what I like to call using the, the it trope, which is like where something bad happens to people when they're kids and then it cuts to years later and they have to face that thing again. Yeah. Um, it's very different from it, but it's, that's the trope that I would say that it falls under. Uh, and it's going to be, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Some of the things that I do in it, okay. that'll probably be out well, probably around February or March. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for um, speaking with me today and good luck with uh, your releases and obviously your other books that you've got out as well. Um, it's been lovely speaking to you, Cage. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, follow me on social media because uh, I'm fun. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 